Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to our SRP Lunchtime webinars in partnership with AURPO. Hope you all had a great summer. My name is Sarah Hunnack, and I am the chair of the webinar group and director of engagement. So today's webinar is on an introduction to radiation shielding. As always, the ground rules before we start, especially because it's been such a long time since the last one. So you can ask questions at the end of that we asked at the end of the presentation. There's a Q&A box. It should be in the corner of your screen. So if you click on that, you can type in the questions as we go along. Um, also, if you spot any in there that you would also like the answer to, you can like them. And at the end, the aim is to ask as many questions as we can to the presenter, starting with the ones that have got the most likes. Any that we don't get time to answer today will be put to the presenter uh, and will be answered offline and popped onto the SRP website for you to look at later. Um, you can register your attendance at the webinar for CPD points. So the code is there on the screen and you need to email that to admin at SRP UK. Uh, that code will also be popped into the chat box as well, so you can write it down there later. And at the end, you will get an email to ask for your feedback. And as always, it's really important that we get the feedback from you guys so we know what we're doing, what we're doing right, what we're doing, what we could improve on and anything that you would like us to present in the future. As always, I've got to plug uh, being a member, uh, becoming a member of the SRP if you're not already. So we've got lots and lots of really, really great um, benefits of becoming a member. And if you pop onto our website and click on membership at the top right, that will give you all the information there so you can have a look and you can join. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Professor Pete Cole, who is the SRP past president and current AURPO president. Over to you, Pete. Thanks, Sarah. Um, welcome everybody to another one of these training webinars. I'm delighted today to introduce today's speaker. Robert Hill is the Technical Director at Aurora Health Physics. He's been an RP professional for 30 years, both in the ionising and non-ionising fields. He's worked in the nuclear, industrial, healthcare and research sectors. Rob provides bespoke shielding design solutions using Monte Carlo modeling for medical, industrial and high energy research facilities. He provides advice on non-ionizing radiation, including lasers and broadband, static electric and magnetic fields and electromagnetic frequency waves. Rob has acted as an expert witness on both ionizing and non-ionizing radiation legal cases. And Rob's going to give us a guide, an introduction to radiation shielding. Over to you, Rob. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Peter. <clears throat> Why is it when you're just going to talk that you decide to cough? Anyway, uh, do I need to share my screen with you, Sarah, first? Yes, please, Rob, if you can. OK. So hopefully I'm broadcasting this. Yes, you are. Thank you. OK, well, thanks for that introduction, Pete. So I won't bother wasting my time telling you who I am because Pete's already done quite a good job of that. So let's get right into this because I appreciate people have given up uh, at least a part of the lunch hour to take part in this. So the purpose of this chat really or talk is to provide those attending with an awareness of uh, the methods available to determine shielding requirements for simple exposure geometries. Uh, and also possibly make you aware of the limitations and, and uncertainties or errors associated with empirical calculations. And if you're in the business of having to design a facility or asking somebody else to design one on your behalf, it helps to kind of make you an informed customer asking intelligent questions of your shielding designers. So that, that's the kind of overall aim of this. We're going to cover uh, radioactive sources. I know. Pardon me. And I'll be talking about uh, isotropic sources or and the point source approximation. I'll talk about the inverse square law. Gamma ray constants will introduce them and we'll introduce necessarily when you talk about shield, we need to introduce some formula. So we'll look at an attenuation formula. Uh, I'll also discuss build up and the difference between broadband and narrow band, narrow narrow beam, broad beam and narrow beam, sorry. Uh, exposure conditions. We'll introduce linear and mass attenuation coefficients and a uh, half value and also tenth value layers. And put that into some sort of perspective, I'll use or I shall refer to uh, BS4094 as a sort of vehicle to introduce the formulas and all of these things that I've just mentioned. 
So BS 494 Part 1 came out in 1966, so it's quite aged, 56 I think, if my arithmetic is correct. Uh, part 1 deals with shielding uh, from gamma radiation, from gamma sources, radioactive sources, and Part 2 deals with uh, X radiation from uh, usually man-made sources in the forms of X-ray sets. That came out in 1971, so even Part 2 is quite aged. Fortunately for us, though, physics hasn't changed. I'm going to concentrate on part one. So part one deals with gamma radiation and the standard came out uh, well before, you know, the, a radiation protection advisor had ever even thought of. And it was intended to help address shielding problems in industry by giving people useful data and useful information which they could then apply. So the one I'm going to talk about, part one mainly, deals with gamma radiation sources. And this image here shows you it basically encapsulated gamma radiation sources. The ones on the right hand side, uh, with little pigtails associated with them are probably various varieties of radi radiography sources and other high activity sealed sources. They're most likely double encapsulated. What that means is there's, there's two layers of encapsulation to make sure that the source has a high degree of integrity and doesn't easily lose its contents, uh, isn't easily damaged either. So part one of the standards uh, and most empirical calculations take what we call a deterministic approach. And what that means is for the same input values, the same data, you can give that problem to 100 people and bar them pressing the wrong buttons in a calculator, they should all get the same answer out. So it's a deterministic approach. Fixed input values, you get the same answer out. The standard BS494 treats the source as a simple point isotropic source uh, and using that simplification, we can then work out the radiation dose rates from a point source. We can work out the shielded dose rate from a point source and we can use that information to establish the thickness of a primary barrier. A primary barrier is essentially it's a barrier that uh, the it's the first barrier that the radiation impinges upon and then is transmitted through that barrier. A secondary barrier and the other on the other side of it, if you like, is a barrier that deals with scattered radiation or reflected radiation off the primary barrier, or perhaps indirectly coming from the source, say as a head leakage, for example. We would talk about all these things as secondary barriers. So primary barrier, the easiest way to think of it is, is my source directed at that barrier? That would be your primary barrier. The standard also extends this point source idea uh, to a line source and a cylindrical source, and it suggests an approach that you can use uh, for determining the, the thickness of secondary barriers, which secondary barriers usually do not need to be as thick as your primary barrier because you're looking at degraded radiation with a lower energy spectrum. We're not going to talk about any of that stuff. Uh, I'm going to concentrate on simple isotropic point sources. That's why that's great, but it's worth mentioning it. So the point source approximation then, so we've got a little image here of a radioactive source which is meant to be or depicted as emitting radiation into 4 pi, so a, a sphere if you like. If you can imagine an imaginary sphere around that point source, it's emitting radiation in the three dimensions. So when is your point source approximation valid? Well, when the source dimension is small. That's a bit of a politician's answer that one because it's not really very useful. What does small mean? So I tend to use uh, the, the smallest dimension, the source, and I would like to be at least 10 times whatever that dimension is away from that source before I would treat it as a point source. I have seen things in the literature where people will say, well, as long as you're at least three times the smallest dimension or the largest dimension of the source, sorry, uh, at as long as you're at least three times that distance where you can use a point source approximation. I like to be 10 times. Uh, if you do that, your errors should be of the order of a few percent. We're not usually, when we're doing these empirical calculations, concerned with any self attenuation that occurs within the source or within the encapsulation of that source. So we just kind of ignore that. There will be some, but we tend to ignore it. It's usually not very significant. So that's what a point source approximation is. If we look at that uh, in a sort of diagrammatic form, you've got your point source, your isotropic point source on the left here, and you've got a little man who is standing just about to run away, one metre away from that source. Uh, why would he want to run away or to move? Simply because the radiation decays or reduces the dose rate, or the exposure rate, reduces following the inverse square law. So it falls off with one over d squared. So in this case, he's went from one metre to two metres away, one over two, two squared is four, so the dose rate has reduced to a quarter. 
Uh, and that happens because essentially the radiation is now being spread over a much larger area, four times the area. So the, the flux density, if you like, is reduced by a quarter to a quarter. So that's the inverse square law. We're also going to be using a uh, very useful idea of a gamma ray constant. You can look these up in BS4094, uh, but unfortunately, being so old, it uh, quotes gamma ray constants in terms of rongens per hour per curie at one meter. So it's all old units or old money, if you like. So we have to convert that into more modern units, which are already done here on the right hand side. Uh, so the modern units would be micrograde per hour per gigavectral at one meter. So we are going to be using, going to be doing a couple of work examples really to, to bring these concepts together. And in particular, we're going to be looking at cobalt 60. So the gamma ray constant for cobalt 60 is 310.2 micrograde an hour a meter, uh, or for season 137, 77.6 micrograde an hour at one meter. If you do a quick web search, I'm almost certain you will come up with completely different values, but they'll possibly be around this sort of figures. Uh, there's, di there's different values voted for gamma ray constants depending on who, who derived them, what, what circumstances derived them under, and what uncertainties they had in the measurement of them. So these are good enough for our case though. And uh, we'll be using in terms of microsieverts or microgray, sorry, per hour, per gigavectral per hour. If you don't actually know the gamma ray constant, there is a handy graph in uh, the standard where you can select your photon energy, uh, come up from your x-axis, so your horizontal axis, hit the curvy line that you see above and then project across to the left-hand side to find the gamma ray constant that interests you for that particular energy. So for 1.6 MeV photons, if you project up and then across to the vertical axis, you see that we end up with a gamma ray constant of 0 0.78. So bear in mind that's still in brunch, it's peculiar, so you need to convert that to microgay per gigavectral. If you have, uh, and most radioactive sources are, sealed sources tend to have uh, multiple decay schemes, so not, usually not just one energy of interest. You could use this graph to look at the particular gamma decay constant for a particular energy and then weight the contribution of that gamma ray constant, looking at the probabilities of decay for that particular uh, gamma ray energy. We're not going to get into that today, but that's what you can do. So we'll do have a look at a first calculation, and in that calculation, we'll bring together this concept of a, an isotropic point source. We'll use the gamma ray constant. We'll show we'll use the inverse square law, and obviously the source activity. So there's our little diagram. Uh, the position of interest. Uh, you can probably all figure out, is the person sat at their desk who really probably doesn't want to be exposed to radiation from anybody's radioactive source. The formula that we can use is this here. So the dose rate is equal to the gamma ray constant times the source activity, A divided by D squared, because it follows into a square law. So, what is the radiation dose rate at a distance of 3.72 metres away from a 35 gigavectral unshielded cobalt 60 sealed source? And a supplementary question that once you've got the answer is, do you need to apply shielding to reduce the potential radiation exposure at the position of interest? So let's have a look and see what drops out. First thing to do in any of these situations or any problem is write down what you know. So we know it's a cobalt 60 source. We look up the gamma ray constant. We find it's 310.2 microgray per hour per meter per gigabecrel. So there's a clue straight away that you need to know the activity of your source. We know that, 35 gigabecrels. And you also need to know at what distance am I interested in the radiation dose rate from this source? We know that as well. It's 3.72 meters. So it's actually quite a simple matter of plugging the information you already have and just inserting it into the formula. So if you do that, you substitute the information, you find out that the dose rate from this unshielded source at 3.72 metres is 784.6 microgray per hour. So quite a pokey source, even at uh, 3.72 metres. So if we look that back at a little diagram here, so the person sat in their own little cloud of radiation and it's 784 microgray an hour. Do we need to add any shielding? Hopefully you're all nodding your heads and saying, yeah, I think we do. So the first thing we have to decide is 
what kind of dose rate is acceptable? We're not going to get a whole lot of alarm discussions here. I've just picked 0.5 micro an hour as a kind of target dose rate. So the primary barrier that we're going to insert or our shield in between this person and the isotropic point source should be sufficient to attenuate the radiation such that they are only exposed to 0.5 micro an hour. So we can use that information to set up a transmission factor for that shield. And the transmission factor is simply the target dose rate, that's 0.5, divided by the unshielded dose rate, which is approximately 780. So if you substitute the numbers in, you find that your shield should have a transmission factor of 6.37 times 10 to the minus 4. That's, that's the fraction of radiation that you want that shield to uh, tra transmit through to the position of interest. So that's what we require, 6.37 times 10 to minus 4. If you've got access to BS4094, you can look up a transmission factor for the source, cobalt 60, and for the shielding material. So this is uh, one of the figures, figure 2B from the standards. You can see along the bottom, you have various thicknesses of various shields, and you've got three lines there, each represent the transmission uh, for different shielding materials. So you've got a choice of uranium, lead, or iron. So we're going to use lead. The transmission factor, you'll see I've put it in yellow there, uh, and I'm not for a moment suggesting that I have eyesight that can read to 6.37. It's nowhere near that accurate, so you'd probably go for somewhere like 6.4. And read off, project along to the, the line where it says lead and then project down onto the x axis and read off the thickness, which I've taken to be 13.7. So straight away, there's, there's obviously a degree of uncertainty there and that two different people might write up, read, read off slightly different figures, get slightly different answers. However, sticking with the numbers that I've used, we need 13.7 centimetres of lead to reduce our dose rate to its target value of 0.5 microgray per hour. We'll put that information back in. That's what we need the primary barrier thickness to be, 13.7 centimetres thick. So that would hopefully reduce the dose rate to a level that this person sat at the desk was quite happy with. So the final equation is modified by the addition of the transmission factor. So that will take account of the inverse square law decay, the activity of the source, and the transmission factor required by your shield. So we've used a point source approximation. We've applied a gamma ray constant, which we selected from the standard. And we've obviously used the inverse square law to work out with the dose rate as our position of interest. We've set a target dose rate so that we can then work out a transmission factor for the shield. We've selected a shielding material of choice. We could have selected uranium, where we could have chosen iron for that particular graph that I picked up. And then we've used that to determine the thickness of our primary barrier using the transmission graph. That's just a quick summary of what we've done so far. The transmission graph that we used uh, was for what we call broad beam exposure. Uh, and all the transmission graphs in the standard are for broad beam exposure. And what that means is that these graphs of the transmission radiation already take into account build up. Uh, it probably raises the question if you don't already know it, what is build up? And how do you address build up if you don't have to have a broad beam transmission graph for the material that you're going to use as your, for your radiation shield? So let's just have a look at how we actually address this. We actually have to consider uh, a somewhat artificial exposure situation, which we'll call narrow field or narrow beam geometry. So you take your unshielded source and you take your detector and you apply lead shielding to the detector so that uh, you reduce the aperture such that it's only going to receive a very finely collimated beam. So that's you do that with your detector. You then do the same thing with your source. So you, you have a source and you shield it in such a way that it produces a very fine collimated beam, which can be intercepted by your shielded detection. And really what you're looking for is to limit what that detector sees only to, to radiation directly emanating from the source. Uh, not any scattered radiation that might scatter off anything that between its journey of leaving the source and entering the detector. So you get a well collimated detector, only looking at unscattered radiation. 
that's in an ideal world as we are trying to achieve. We then insert a thin shield of a known thickness. That's usually quite straightforward because we can measure that. So we can establish the thickness of a shield with a reasonable degree of accuracy. Uh, what you can see straight away there is that this shield will remove some of those photons from the beam. So you have attenuation in the beam because the photons are no longer reaching the detector. So you've attenuated it in some way. The amount of photons that are removed from that beam is directly proportional to the thickness of that shield. So if you double the thickness of that shield, you will double or half uh, the number of photons that reach your detector. So there's a, we can define a thing called the linear attenuation coefficient, which we give the symbol mu, uh, and that tells us the effectiveness for the fractional removal of photons of any, any shield that we choose to insert between our detector and our source. So the units of your linear attenuation coefficient is in per centimetre, send me up to the minus one. I'll introduce the next formula that we're going to be using, which is this one here. So on the left hand side, you've got your attenuated beam intensity. So it's passed through the shield it has been reduced. Which is equal to the initial source output radiation dose rate, if we're going to talk about dose rate. And multiplied by the exponent raised to the index mu, which is your linear attenuation coefficient multiplied by your shielding thickness. So the prolog mu x is quite important. It's worth bearing in mind here that this uh, linear attenuation coefficient is energy dependent and material dependent. So what that means is if you change the energy of your radiation, you either increase it or you lower it, the value for the linear attenuation coefficient will change. If you change the thickness or sorry, not the things, obviously it will change, change the thickness, but if you change the material, so say you're using concrete and you've said actually, I've got my hands or I've got access to some lead blocks, can I use lead? Yes, of course you can, but you're going to have to look at the attenuation coefficient because the attenuation coefficient is material dependent, so it's energy and material dependent. So looking back at this narrow field uh, geometry or narrow beam geometry, that's our equation. So on the left hand side, we've got the source output, I naught. And really, on the right hand side, you've got your attenuated beam, which is a function of the linear attenuation coefficient and the thickness of the shield. What happens in the real world is not replicated. That's not our, our simple narrow beam geometry doesn't really describe what happens in the real world. So if you look at the very top ray here, so had the wrong button there. The ray highlighted in yellow, if it was undeviated, if it transmitted through the shield without any interactions whatsoever, it would clearly go above the person who sat at the desk. It would go above the head and it wouldn't cause them any exposure at all. However, that's not actually what happens in the shield. You can see that the at the first circle on the left hand side, the photon beam, let's just treat it as a single photon, undergoes an interaction and is either re-emitted or scattered in a different direction. At the second interaction point, which is the upper of the two circles, you can see that the photon is scattered back down and therefore causes an exposure of the person sat at the desk. So essentially, the, the process that has taken place within the shield has resulted in an increased exposure of the person at the desk. So I've Kind of rather loosely called it scattered radiation. It may not be scattered, it may be re-emitted, but if we take the terminology for the purpose of the description, we'll just treat it as scattered radiation. But essentially what's happened there is that the direction of the radiation has changed and it's been scattered back to our point of interest or redirected to our point of interest. And that means that that's going to cause an increase in exposure of the person. And that's described, uh, I was given the general description as the term build up. Build, build up is the increase or it's the increase over and above the number of photons that would come through the position of interest if they didn't interact with the shielding material at all, i.e. transmitted straight through, they were unscattered, uninteracted photons. And what you're measuring there is the increase in the number of photons. We call that build up. So 
I'm, I'm not a great fan of the term build up because people tend to think, oh, build up occurs in the shield as if they're uh, like putting water in a bath or the bath fills up with water. It's not that kind of process at all. What's actually happened is radiation, secondary radiations are generated within the, the radiation shield and they're redirected to the position of interest causing an increase in the exposure rate. Therefore, you're causing a build up or an increase in someone's exposure. We can take account of this thing called build up by adding a term to our earlier equation. So we add the letter B for build up and build up is a function of distance. So the thicker the shield, the greater the build up. The higher the atomic number of the shield, uh, the amount of build up tends to reduce and the lighter the atomic number of shield build up tends to increase. So it's a function of thickness. Higher energy as well, sorry, sorry, higher energy from maybe we said that earlier. Higher energy tends to reduce, so higher energies tend to have less build up, lower energies tend to have greater build up, thicker shields tend to have greater build up as well. So we can define build up in terms of multiples of this product mu times x. So mu is your linear attenuation coefficient, x is your shielding thickness, and we refer to this product as a mean free path. So the product itself tells you the number of means mean free paths uh, in a shielding material. And that's taken to be the distance travelled between interactions within your shield. So how do we use this equation and how do we use that to establish the effects of build up within a shielding material and take account of that? So let's use cesium-137 as a source this time. Before I go there, it's worth pointing out that uh, BS4094 lists, or it says it lists, mass attenuation coefficients. So it says there, table one, mass absorption coefficients, uh, centimetre square per grams of units. And you can see that someone, I don't know who, but somebody before I had this copy of the standard, had rather helpfully scrubbed the absorption and written attenuation. I believe that what is listed in BS4094 is in fact mass attenuation coefficients and not mass absorption coefficients. Uh, I haven't checked them all, I've checked a few of them, and the, the values that I found elsewhere for attenuation coefficients correlated pretty well with the ones produced here, so I'm fairly happy that they're attenuation coefficients, but if you're going to use this, then make sure you're happy yourself. An absorption coefficient, since we're talking about them, tells you how much radiation, how much energy has been deposited in the material, so how much energy has it absorbed from the interaction. An attenuation coefficient simply tells you how much radiation has been removed by the shielding material, which is not the attenuation is not the same as absorption. So given that we've got mass attenuation coefficients, what we actually want is the linear attenuation coefficient because that's what our equation uses. Well, it turns out there's a really simple conversion between the two. Your mass attenuation coefficient is simply your linear attenuation coefficient divided by the material density, whatever it happens to be. So we'll pick a material and we'll use concrete because it's abundant and it's a good structural material. And if we rearrange that equation, we can see that mu L, the subscript L meaning linear, uh, is equal to mu M, M being mass, that's mass attenuation, multiplied by the density material rho will give you the linear attenuation coefficient. It's a fairly simple manipulation. If you look in the standard, we're interested in cesium-137, so 66 keV, 0.66 MeV. We don't have a listing for a mass attenuation coefficient for 0.66 MeV, so we do what all health physicists do, and we kind of approximate, or given its work right correct term, we will interpolate between these two values and, and estimate the value for 0.66 MeV. So the value I arrived at is 0 0.079, so that's the mass attenuation coefficient. So I've got to convert that into a linear attenuation coefficient. So mu m is 0 0.079. We know that concrete has a density. Standard concrete Portland cement made of Portland cement has got a density of 2.35 grams per centimetre cubed. If you're working with a different concrete, you need to use the concrete density for the concrete that you're going to use. So we'll choose 2.35 grams per centimetre cubed and we'll use that. So if you multiply the mass attenuation coefficient by the density of the concrete, we end up with the linear attenuation coefficient for cesium of 0.186 per centimetre. So let's see which shielding we need then. 
So an employer needs to protect the staff from source maintenance work taking place next to a main office. The maximum activity that's ever going to be used is 111 gigabit row season 137 source and only one source will be exposed at a time. Clearly you're going to have to put in some administrative controls or perhaps engineering controls to make sure that only one source can be exposed. But if we satisfy ourselves that only one can be exposed, we can then go looking at what's a shielding we need to adequately protect someone from that source. So that's what the question is essentially. What shielding is required to reduce accessible radiation dose rates at a distance of two metres from the source? Uh, that two metres is basically outside of facility where someone will be sat, so as per the earlier diagram. And again, we want our target dose rate to be 0.5 microgray per hour. So right there, what we know, the gamma ray constant for cesium is 77.6 microgray per hour per gigavectron. And the linear attenuation coefficient for season 137 is 0.186. So we need to multiply that up by the activity of the source, which is 111 gigabetos. So that gives us a total unshielded dose rate at one meter of 8.6, well, eight, roughly 8.6 milligray or 8613.6 microgray per hour. So that's unshielded. We want to know what the dose rate is at two metres from the source. So the inverse square law applies there, so we'll multiply it by one over d squared, where d is two. And we see that the two metres of dose rate has reduced to 2,153.4 microgray per hour. So it's still quite a reasonably high dose rate, not one you would want to be exposed to. So we require a target dose rate of 0.5. So the question there is how thick does the shield need to be? So we can rearrange the formula i equals i naught e to the minus mu x and we can arrange that for x and that will give us an initial value which we can then use to look up uh, values for our build up factor and we can substitute those factors back into this amended equation and we don't go through an iterative process to establish how thick x needs to be taking account of the build up. It sounds a lot more complicated than explaining it. If I walk through this example, you'll, you'll see what I mean. So rearranging for x, we get x equals minus the natural log of the i over i naught divided by the linear attenuation coefficient. So substituting the numbers in there, we can see that our initial thickness of x, we're going to take a stab at x being 44.9 centimetres of concrete. I mentioned earlier this thing called the number of mean three paths, which is mu x. That becomes important because the question you have to ask yourself is how many mean three paths are there in 44.9 centimetres of concrete? Now, the reason you need to know that is build up factors are generally either in graphical form where you look up the number of mean three paths in material for a given thickness or the tabulated where you look up the number of mean three paths and then you read across to get a, a build up factor. So that's why you need to know how many mean three paths are. So that's the first part of your next calculation. It's a fairly straightforward calculation. It's simply mu times x. X is 44.9 and mu is 0.186. So you multiply these two numbers together and you find out that in 44.9 centimetres of concrete for cesium-137, there are 8.35 mean three paths. So you then have recourse to your graph of uh, build up factors, or if you're looking at tabulated values, look up a table. And BS4094, rather unhelpful, you can see that we do not have a curve for 66 kV or 0.66 MeV. So we do the next best thing, and I've kind of eyeballed where I think a 0.66 MeV curve would be, and that's represented by the 90 degree corner shown in yellow there. So that's another source of error straight away. You know, somebody else might think it's higher or might think it's lower. It's an estimate after all. So looking along the horizontal axis, you'll see that I haven't tried to be as accurate as 8.35. I've rounded that up to four. So it's another source of error or estimate. And reading across by projecting up to my imaginary 0.66 line, I've then jumped across on the, on the vertical axis and read off the build up factor which I have taken to be 26. So what we're now going to do is substitute the value of 26 into our 
amended formula. So that's B, the build up factor equals 26. If we plug that back into the formula, we can see what effect that has on the, the dose rate. And that's simply substitute the values and you can see that your attenuated dose rate has now dropped to 13.2 microgray per hour. Our target is 0 0.5, so we still don't have a thick enough radiation shield. Not enough. So I've taken a rough guess and added another 15 centimetres of concrete. So the question to ask yourself is how much or how many mean free paths are there in 59.9 centimetres of concrete, which is simply the initial 44.9 plus the additional 15. And we've established or I've established that there's 11.14 mean free paths. So we go through the same exercise. We go back to the graph. We look up this time I've ditched the 0.14 and just let's call that 11. And again, I've projected up to my imaginary graph. And I've just noticed here that I've made it somewhat higher up, but you get the idea for the purpose of this demonstration. I read across and this time I've deduced or estimated that there are 44, or the fact the build-up factor is 44. So substituting that back factor B equal to 44 back into the formula gives us a, a reduced dose rate of 1.37 microgram an hour. Still not enough, so we require 0.5. So take another stab at it, I've just arbitrarily added another 10 centimetres. So we've now got 69.9 centimetres of concrete. And the number of mean three paths in that 69.9 centimetres of concrete is now 13. So going back to our graph, looking up 13 mean three paths, you can see that I've estimated our build-up factor is now 56. So let's plug that back in and we end up with a shielded dose rate of 0.27 microgray. So that's less than our target 0.5. So 69.9 centimetres of shielding, let's call it 70, is enough to achieve our target dose rate. If you wanted to be a bit more accurate, you could go back and reduce the thickness of the concrete. You might make 10, 8 and then see if you're still below 0.5. We can also introduce what's so useful interest to introduce the concept of a half value layers here. The linear attenuation coefficient I mentioned earlier indicates that there's a, a linear relationship between the thickness of the material and the attenuation that material provides. So can we set the attenuation for a given thickness material so that it's a nice useful usable fraction such as a quarter or a half or a fifth or a tenth? Pick a number that you find useful. Half is quite a useful number to work with. So we can actually specify shielding in terms of a thing called half value layers. So we have a source. You'll see it's collimated in this case again. We've got an output in this case, 240,000 units. So we'll call it microgray per hour. What thickness of shield do I need that will reduce the intensity of that radiation from 240,000? 230, sorry, 120,000. Once I've established what that thickness is, I have then established the thickness of a half value layer or a half value thickness. So if I put another one of these layers in, another shielding layer, I'll reduce it by a half again, and I'll drop the dose rate to 60,000. Adding more and more subsequent half value layers keeps causing the dose rate to reduce by a half. So it's, it's quite a powerful concept and it quite rapidly enables us to work out just how many shield and half value layers we need to get to the desired number. And I've stopped at 7,500, but clearly you're not going to leave a shielded structure with 7.5 milligray or millisieverts an hour coming through it. That's probably not good enough. However, it's just to demonstrate the, the concept. So in terms of working out what a dose rate is, we have 240,000 multiplied by 0.5 for the number of half value layers that we've included. So there's five half value layers there, so you'll see there's five times 0.5 multiplying this uh, 240,000, giving you an increased fractional reduction with each new successive layer. Writing that in shorthand, 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 is exactly the same as 0.5 raised to the power 5. 
and more generically we'll call it n, where n is a number of half value layers. So in this case, we've got five half value layers, so n is a value of five. So right now in English, the attenuated dose rate is equal to the unattenuated dose rate times 0.5 raised to the power n, where n is the number of half value layers that you actually have. If you don't have a half value layer for a particular material, but you do know what the material is, and you do know what the learning attenuation coefficient is for that material, you can actually work out what the half value layer is. So here's how you would go about doing that. You take this formula and you take the ratio of I over I naught and you set it equal to 0.5. And then you equate that to uh, e to the minus mu x, so I over I naught equals 0.5, which is equal to E for the exponent of minus mu x. If you then take logarithms to both sides, that gets rid of the exponent. So you end up with the log of 0.5 equals minus mu x. And if you look at the log of zero, natural logarithm of 0.5, that's minus 0.693. So the two negatives cancel it. And what you end up with is x is equal to x being the thickness, is equal to 0 0.693 divided by the linear to attenuation coefficient for that material. What we have established, because we set the target dose rate and the input dose rate to 0.5, we have determined the thickness of material that will cause an atten a reduction in the intensity of the radiation by half. So we've defined the half value thickness. So it's quite straightforward to establish what the half value thickness is for materials if you know the linear attenuation coefficient and you know your material. So let's look at cesium-137 and we'll choose concrete as a material. So for cesium-137 the linear attenuation coefficient is 0.186 so let's just substitute that in and see what the half value layer is and it turns out that if you divide that by 0.186 we find that the half value layer for cesium-137 is 3.72 centimetres. So you've readily established what the HVL is, half value layer for uh, concrete. A word of caution though, because we have derived the linear attenuation coefficient, sorry, because we've derived the half value layer using the linear attenuation coefficient, this half value layer does not take account broad beam conditions and it does not take account build up because it's it, the linear attenuation coefficient was derived using narrow beam conditions. It's still a useful idea though. You can also extend this idea of half value layers because we can, we can choose the thickness of the shield that reduces the intensity of the radiation by a given fraction. We can choose whatever that fraction is. So we chose a half initially, but there's no reason why we couldn't make it 0.1 or a tenth. If you do that, you would then have a tenth value layer thickness for a given material. And each time you put a successive shield in, it reduces the external dose rate or the transmitted dose rate by a factor of 0.9. If you have a HVL, half value layer, and you want to know what the tenth value layer, it's approximately 3.32 uh, times a half value layer thickness. It's going to be thicker if you think about it logically. If you want to reduce the radiation dose rate to a tenth of what it is, you're going to have to have a thicker shield than something that's only going to reduce it to a half of what it was unshielded. So let's do another calculation where we revisit the earlier one, where we looked at the build-up. We rearranged that formula to estimate the thickness it required when we were feeding in our first estimation of the shield and thickness when we went to work out what the build-up factor was before we went to that iterative process. This is another way you could arrive at your initial thickness to plug into that formula at the start of your iterations. So this is just revisiting the earlier problem. So the employer wants to protect staff from source maintenance work taking place in the main office. We've got the same source at two metres. We've got the dose rate outside the facility, which we want to be 0.5 micro an hour, and we've got the same 111 gigabectral source. Because of the inverse square law, we established that the dose rate, the unprotected dose rate at the position of interest is 2,153.4 micrograde per hour. Our target dose rate is 0.5, so 
we need to establish uh, some kind of transmission factor, and we can use that to get a good first guess at evaluating buildup. We can use the half value layer idea to estimate where that number should be or where the thickness of that shield should be. So if we call it a transmission factor, it was 0.5 target dose rate divided by the unprotected or unshielded source dose rate at the position of interest, we end up with a transmission factor of 2.32 times 10 to minus 4. So to find out how many half value layers would give us that transmission factor, we simply just set one equal to the other. So 0.5 raised to the power n is equal to 2.44 times 10 to minus 4. It's quite a simple operation if you simply plug that into your calculator 0.5 raised to the power n and just keep plugging in different values of n to get a number that approximates or gets close to the value of 2.44 times 10 to minus 4. So substitute the value of n to get the answer that's either spot on or pretty close. So it turns out that if you set n equal to 12, 0.5 raised to the power 12 equals 2.44 times 10 to minus 4. It's not exactly 2.32 times 10 to minus 4, but it's close enough. So that, that would give you the transmission factor that's pretty close. So all we have to do then is multiply the number of half value layers by the thickness to get the total thickness of the shield. So 12 times a half value layer for cesium is a good initial starting point when you're going to do look at the effect of buildup within that shield. So the half value layer is 3.2 centimetres. So 12 times 3.2 gives you an initial starting thickness in concrete, which will address buildup of 44.6 centimetres. So you can plug that value in and start your iterative process and go through exactly the same process that we did earlier to end up with a, a value which would then take account of the effect of buildup. Part two, I'm only going to very briefly mention part two just to really tell you what's in there. There is some useful information, but this time it deals really with X-ray sets. And it gives you various useful X-ray tube output data from 50 keV. Right? X-ray sets operating at 50 keV kilo electron volts up to 35 MeV for different filtration materials and different thicknesses. What I mean by filtration materials is they're, they're putting metals within the beam to, re to remove probably lower energy components aren't going to contribute to whatever the function of the X-rays is. The units are in terms of rontgens per hour per milliamp minute at a quoted distance, and that quoted distance will usually be 0.1 or 1 meters. So you need to change rontgens, which is a unit of exposure, into microgray or microsievers per hour, whatever units you desire. So you're going to have to do a bit of manipulation there. There's also transmission graphs in the standards which show you shielding versus x-ray energy for several materials below 50 kV and for concrete and lead above 50 kV. That's because concrete and lead are generally the source of materials that you use in the shielding for photon radiation. There are tabulated lead equivalent values at various tube kilovoltages for narrow beam conditions. So bear in mind that's not going to tell you everything you need to know because just as you get build up within a shield, for gamma ray sources, you will get build up within a shield for X-ray sources. There's some useful half value HVL and 10th value layer thicknesses for various tube film kilovoltage as well. This time, usefully for broadband condition. So you don't need to worry about build up because it's already been taken account of. Uh, there's also a simple method of uh, addressing scattered off walls. And there's a table of nuclear specific Bremsstrahlen transmission through light. So what are the pros and cons of uh, the empirical approach? Pros is it's fairly quick and relatively easy to do. It's good for single sources and it's good for a single shield material. The downside is it only applies to photons, or the standard does. You need to make approximations in your calculations, as, as we've seen with me estimating values and graphs and reading off graphs or even making up graphs where there wasn't one. That can introduce significant errors either way. The empirical approach is not so good for multiple energy sources. Your calculations can become complex and it's easy to assume complexity for accuracy. And that's a mistake you do not want to be making. It's not useful at all, really, for complex source geometries, laminated shields or even completed complex shield geometries. And although there's a method given for uh, 
dealing with scattered radiation off walls and things, it's it's kind of limited and it's limited to the setup that the empirical calculations were derived from. And it also can't address streaming through vents, apertures, gaps, etc. And all sorts of uh, shielding things that you find in shields, holes, etc. I just want to, before I leave the standard, just talk quickly about half value layer thicknesses. So this was a graph that I introduced a few minutes ago uh, where I said you can decide a thickness of material and you can decide a fractional reduction that you want. In this case, we want a 50% reduction or a half. And you can simply keep replacing additional half value thicknesses of that material and you will get exactly half of the radiation coming through in each subsequent transmission. That's actually not the case. Real life is ever so slightly more complex than that. I've exaggerated the effect here, but you can see that for each subsequent half value layer, the half value layer actually gets a little bit thicker. And that's because in the real world, what has actually happened is the first half value layer will remove lower energy photons. So you've got a spectrum of radiation coming through that you're in your main beam. The first half value layer will remove a proportion of the lower energy photons, which simply will not make it through the shield. So the average energy in your transmitted beam is increasing. And because your linear attenuation coefficient is energy dependent, the thickness actually increases. You need to increase the thickness of the shield to get the same fractional reduction. As I said, I've exaggerated the effect here, but you can see that it's not simply a same thickness replicated again and again and again. HVLs and TVLs actually increase until some limiting value determined by the maximum energy of the radiation of the source. Your, energy, your beam is hardening as it passes through successive shields. I mentioned more complex problems. So what would we call a more complex problem? Com more complex problem would be one where you've got multiple sources at different locations, or you've got a multiple or variable energy source or a source with a spectrum. A lot of sources have spectrums. You've got a mixed field source, perhaps, or a single source with complex geometry or complex shielding structure. So it might not just be a single shield, it might be a composite shield made out of various different materials. The actual room that you're trying to protect against might have many scattering objects or surfaces within it, which are arranged in a complex manner. Almost all shielding structures will have some degrees of penetrations in them. There are cavity structures as well. There might be streaming pathways like ducts, conduits, cable runs, that sort of thing. Or your source might generate secondary sources uh, through a variety of complex interactions producing neutrons or, or even protons. So the way to address these things is to use a radiation transport code which is a probabilistic rather than a deterministic assessment process. And the way they generally work is you take a photon, if we just stick with photons for the time being, and you follow the each and every interaction that that photon has as it's transmitted through the material. And each time it undergoes a new interaction, it's banked, and that initial photon is tracked until it no longer undergoes any interaction, tracked till death, if you like. The code then goes back and looks at all the interactions that happened along the way and all the secondary particles that were generated and it tracks them until they no longer interact. So what you end up with is a statistical model where you have produced a large number of data giving you a large number of interactions and you're looking for your um, data to, uh, what's my word that I'm looking for here? You're looking for it to uh, converge. On, on and give you a single answer. And what, you, what you're looking for it to converge on is the average value. So the average value of say dose rate that you're looking at a particular place. To run things like Monte Carlo code, it requires expertise and knowledge of the physics used, uh, and you need to build your model. It takes time to run because you need a large number of histories per simulation to get good statistics. And because of that, it can be slow to reach a solution. But if you think for a moment what it actually means, you've got a detector placed on the safe side of a thick shielding barrier. The purpose of that shielding barrier is to remove photons, so you don't want any photons coming through. However, if you don't have any photons coming through, you can't count them. If you can't count them, you don't get good statistics. So you can see that the better your shield, the longer it's going to take to run your simulation. The advantage of Monte Carlo is it can be very accurate, but it can also be completely inaccurate if you don't put the right information in. 
This is a schematic of a model, which is a plan view of a linear accelerator. The different colors on the right hand side show you a beam dump, which is laminated with various different kinds of materials. But the real advantage of Monte Carlo is you can place a whole array of detectors and end up with a, a nice map showing you the dose rate over large surfaces. So each one of these little cells that you can see in these little grids is actually a dose cell. And what you get from that is a nice colour diagram showing you the plot of the radiation fields uh, at that particular place in your three dimensional model. So in this case, we've looked at neutron dose rates and we looked at photon dose rates. Top left is a snapshot of a Monte Carlo model of a linear accelerator and bottom right in the same picture you can see as you zoom in you can see that the model's actually got some complexity added to it. Bottom left you can see the real facility which is constructed from concrete and you can see that that is identical to the Monte Carlo model and that's one of the real advantages that your model can take account of the complexities that you're going to encounter in real life. Uh, over to the right hand side, some of you may know the facility, it's an Aberdeen facility uh, and that's what it looks like once it's been finished, shielding has been constructed and the facilities have been built around it. Thank you for attending.